to move that down. Um, if you will stand and join us, we're going to start with hymn number 125, Joy to the World, and we're going to sing the first, second, and last verses. Sing. Good morning. Good to see you all. Quickly wink at someone. Three people go wink at them if you have a mask on. I've never been a good winker. That's something in my eye? Yes, yes. Get it out, Mark. Get it out. All right. Good to see you all here on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We are getting closer. Um, first... Let me do a couple of announcements before we get our service started. Um, gift cards, if you are wondering about that, we're still taking that up for the tornado victims up north in Kentucky and Arkansas. So um, we have someone that we are going to give those cards to, and they have pastors of churches in the areas that, are, that were hit. They will uh, hand out those gift cards to families in need. But you are going to have all the rest of this month and the month of January to collect those gift cards if you, you would like to help. Um, I told them that we would spend a great deal of time collecting as much as we could for them. Don't forget about the Christmas mission offering as well. So there's many ways that you can give this Christmas season. And then obviously do not forget about this Friday. This Friday is Christmas Eve if you did not know that already, but you're going to be here at four o'clock, you're going to bring your family, and you're going to be ready to celebrate the service of in the time of Christmas and lighting our fifth candle of Advent and start the Christmas season. So excited. Hope you are too. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to be here in this place safely. We thank you for the reason that we're here. And we are so grateful for this time of year. And we're about to go into a week of so much rush and busy and seeing people and smiling and happy and joy. But let us not forget about you. Let us put look past all of that that may distract us and remember that little babe in a manger that brings peace and joy and salvation. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we light the candle of love. 
Last Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. We light it and the candles of hope and peace again as we remember that Jesus, born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of God's promises and bring to us everlasting peace, hope, joy, and love. Today we light the fourth candle of Advent, the candle of love. Scripture tells us that whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Christ's birth is an act of love from God. The incarnation reveals to us God's deep love for us and God's desire for us to dwell with him. Love is like a candle shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the love we have in Christ. All right, one more hymn, if you'll stand with us. And we're going to turn to page uh, 134, and we're going to sing Emmanuel. We're going to sing through it twice.
on me now to carry your son.
with all the strength of a hurricane could have come like a forest fire with the power of heaven in your flame but you came like a winter snow quiet and so From the sky in the night to the earth below could have swept in like a tidal wave or in an ocean to ravish our hearts you could have come through like a roaring You came like a winter snow, yes you did, quiet and soft and slow, falling from the sky in the night to the earth I don't know what produces more anxiety. Singing or having music. One of these things. <laughs> <clears throat> Some of you are just hoping that nobody asks you to do that. <laughs> We're going to do something a little different this morning. Um, we have a guest preacher today. Well, maybe actor is better. better. Uh, this young man is precious to us because he's our first grandson. He's 14 years old, an eighth grader at Simmons Middle School in Birmingham. He plays on the football team. He plays the tuba. And it's really hard to do both of those at one time. <laughs> he's active in his church. He even uh, takes a turn on the camera when they... Uh, record and, and film their, uh, their services. And I asked him to come and help me today because we want to tell the Christmas story a little differently for you this morning. And you need to be, uh, you need to be kind and patient and tolerant. So we're going to have some fun, and I hope you will enjoy our little, uh, our little drama. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Wally Cronkite. And I uh, work for the Jerusalem News Network, and I've been hearing about some really uh, interesting events that have taken place just down the road in a little village called Bethlehem. And um, I'm, I'm in Bethlehem now to um, do some investigation. I want to find out what's behind this story, and um, I'm going to try to find some folks who can give us a little more insight as to what actually occurred. So I want to see if I can find somebody who is um, a part of the community, somebody local, so... 
Let's see if I can find some. Oh, here's somebody right here. Hey, come up here for a minute, will you? Uh, sir, my name is Wally Cronkite. I'm with the Jerusalem News Network. And um, just really interested in what's been going on in your, uh, your little town here. Could you tell us uh, your name? Ichabod. Ichabod? <laughs> well, I see that uh, you must work uh, here. Uh, you work for the Holiday Inn of Bethlehem, it says here. <laughs> Um, is there any chance that you're the innkeeper? So, you know, I heard that there are a lot of people have been in and out of town. Um, and one night there was a young couple who came, and uh, they, were, they came in late, and she was, the lady was really under some stress. And um, I heard that when they came to ask for a place that you said to them, no room in the inn, that's kind of cold, isn't it? Hey, you don't understand. I had to double book my inn to handle the overflow crowd. Uh -huh. The village was full of travelers, and I was already running out of towels and those little bottles of shampoo. <laughs> so you probably could tell that that woman could be giving birth at any moment, and you did nothing to help? Hey, I didn't say I didn't help. I did. I know a guy who knows a girl who knows a guy who knows another girl that owns a limestone cave just outside of town. I worked it out. I made sure there was plenty of fresh hay and water. And by the way, I, char I didn't charge them nothing. Nothing. You didn't nothing. charge them nothing. Okay. <laughs> um, well, that's really nice of you. But let me ask, you sent them into, out to a stable. Is that right? Hey, I did the best I could. I even sent one of the midwives from the village to help. Later that night, I went to check on them. I heard the cry of a baby, so I didn't want to disturb them. Wow, what a night. Hey, I know you're busy. Thanks for your time. I'm going to keep looking because I think there's probably somebody else who can help us here. So you all know this story pretty well, I imagine, here in this part of the country. But I wanted to go just a little bit deeper. I wanted to find somebody who may have been more a part of the story. So we're going to keep looking until we find somebody else who can give just a little different perspective to um, what occurred that night. Now, we know kind of how, it, how the story unfolds. But we, we don't really have a full idea of some of who the characters were. So I'm going to see perhaps there's, a, there's another one who's getting changed and will be out here any moment now and uh, <laughs> see if we can't find something else. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> have you been uh, in the eggnog? Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask you a few questions. Would that be all right? Sure. What do you want to know? Well, first of all, my name is Wally Cronkite. I work for the Jerusalem News Network, and I'm down here in Bethlehem trying to find out some of the story details about what occurred here, and you're obviously from around here. Um, what's your name? Shep. <laughs> Shep. Are you a shepherd? <gasps> what gave me away? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> the staff and the clothes and the smell. Funny. You try hanging around those critters and see how fragrant you are. Okay, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Um, so tell me what happened. What's going on down here in Bethlehem? So we were camping on the hillside, right? Mm -hmm. And the sheep finally settled down. The sheep finally settled down, okay. And all was quiet until. Until what? I'm pretty sure you're not going to believe me. Well, give me a try. Well, see First, one of them. Then, a whole flock of them. A whole flock of them. Are we still talking about sheep? Oh, no. This was different. This? Way different. Uh -huh. The sky lit up, and there was talking and singing, and a lot more singing. Who, who was talking and who was singing? Have you ever seen an angel? No, I don't think so. Well, I have a whole flock of them. Are you sure you weren't dreaming? If it was a dream, it was the most amazing dream I ever had. Why, why do you think angels came to a bunch of shepherds? I don't know. We don't have the best of reputations, you know. That's true. That's true. Well, then, what were they trying to tell you? What was their message? Well, they told us about a baby, but not just any baby. They told us that this was the news that was going to change the world. They even told us where to find the little guy. And so... No. 
You went and you found him? We and went what? and we went and found him. And there he was, just like they said. Uh huh. Then what? We woke up the entire village. I bet you did. Then what? Some people were mad, and then some people were mad at us for waking him up. But some listened and believed. Gotta go. Wow, what a child. All right. Thanks, Shep. <laughs> Shepherds were not known to be the uh, most trustworthy uh, people. In fact, you know, uh, if you were a shepherd, they wouldn't let you give testimony in court because they thought shepherds lied. I think that's kind of interesting that news like that was passed on to a group of people that were not well trusted. Hmm. I wonder why God chose to do it that way. People like Shep to tell us what this baby was all about. Well, you know, um, we also heard that sometime after the birth, uh, some other people were in town. These were people from out of town, and they came into the, the village, and, and they, had, they were on their own kind of errand. And so um, this was a sort of a mysterious group, and they were, um, they were there, and they came in a, in a caravan, and um, I don't know if you've ever met somebody like this. I know I had never met anybody like this, so maybe um, he's now changed and ready to come in, so uh, we'll see what happens here. Here he is. <coughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, greetings, greetings. How are you, sir? Good. Oh, good. Great. What? Well, tell us your name. Gaspar. Gaspar. Mm -hmm. Well, my name is Wally Cronkite. I work for the Jerusalem News Network, and we are interviewing people here. But I understand there's something a little different about about you. Uh, you have some time I can talk to you. Granted, but I have very little time. My caravan must leave very soon. Well, why are you in such a hurry? We have accomplished what we came here to do, but not everyone was excited about what happened here. Oh, really? Well, can you tell me what, 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 what do you mean? They weren't excited about it. We are a group of star kids. We came, we, you may call us scientists or astronomers. We noticed an unusual star in the sky, and we followed it here to this country. Mm -hmm. We stopped in Jerusalem to see King Herod. Oh, really? And hoping he could help us. But we became suspicious of him when he consulted with his advisors. Uh-huh. Well, so you came here anyway. Indeed we did. We were determined to find the source of the wonder we saw in the sky. Imagine to our surprise when we found a young boy in this small village, and we instantly recognized that he was he was special. We brought, we brought gifts to honor him, and we worshiped him because we believed that God was present in him. But you got to leave because you're we, in a hurry. We're in a hurry because we don't trust Herod. Uh -huh. His child parents are taking him away to keep him safe. It's time for us to leave too, but we will never forget this moment or this child. Astounding. What a child. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And that's the way it really happened. What do you think it was like? Usually at the nativity, we have everybody, right? We got Mary and Joseph, and we have the baby, and we have the donkey and the cow, and we might have a few shepherds, but we also have the Wise men, don't we? Don't we have them crowded in as well? The Bible tells us that they didn't show up that first night, the night of his birth, but they were a part of this unfolding story because God had a message for us, a message that he wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And this message was a life unlike any other. There are a lot of famous people. It's amazing to me what makes people famous these days. A lot of times it has to do with how well they play a game or how well they sing or act or whatever, and they're big dollars in those kinds of things. But I don't know. That kind of fame doesn't really impress me. It's people who make a difference in the world. It's people who, whose influence outlasts them. Well, the life that we honor at this time of the year, well, his influence is 
unique. I want you to listen to this. It's probably something that you've heard, but it's one of my special readings during this season of the year, and it's called One Solitary Life. He was born in a little farming village far from here in time and place. His mother was a peasant girl. He was raised in the hill country learning the trade of a carpenter. At 30 years of age, he left his family and home to become a wandering preacher and teacher. He didn't write a book. He never held public, public office. He didn't possess academic credentials. He didn't travel to the big cities of his day. In fact, he never ventured further than 200 miles from the place of his birth. He didn't have any of the things that usually accompany greatness. His only credential was himself. He was an intelligent man who had so much integrity and dignity that he couldn't be bought or intimidated. He was independent of human failure and sin, but not separated from human pain and experience. He was firm in his convictions and profound in both word and deed. He was a man of strong character and deep passion, whose eyes could blaze in the face of injustice or tear in the presence of suffering. When he was 33, his world turned against him. His enemies grew bold and dangerous. His friends ran away. Arrested on trumped-up charges, he was handed over to those who condemned him to death. He was nailed to a Roman cross between two criminals while a squad of soldiers gambled for the only article of clothing that he owned. When he was dead, he was buried in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. Much has happened in this world since he came along some 2,000 years ago, yet he remains the focal character of all of human history. No force or power, be it political, social, economic, or religious, no person, be king, warrior, scholar, scientist, or prophet, none of these influences or persons individually or collectively have affected humanity in time or eternity as he did and continues to do. One solitary life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that son is named Jesus. I don't know how Christmas is for you. For us as a family, when I was small, I can still remember some of those traditions that we participated in. It was a time for family and, and for friends. But I can remember that my grandmother, when she could no longer do this, passed on to my mother the responsibility of reading the Christmas story out of Luke 2. And we had to sit and listen and not move. We couldn't squirm. We couldn't talk. It was too important. And as a kid, you wonder, what's the big deal? Until I began to understand what the big deal was all about. For God so loved the world. Can you imagine how hard it is to love the world these days? I mean, I'm hard enough to love, and you're hard enough to love. Put us all together. What a challenge. And yet we're told that there's nothing that you and I can do that can make God quit loving us that we matter that much to him, that we matter so much to him that what was most precious, he was willing to sacrifice. If you ever wonder if you're worth anything, that's all you have to do. You can look at the manger, and you can look at the cross, and you can look at the tomb, and guess what? All three are empty. You're not going to find him. Not there. Where you ought to find him is right here, in your heart. That's where he belongs. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And if you look at the word Lord carefully, you realize that it's not just about power and authority because the Lord was responsible for the well-being of his people. He wanted to look after the people under his care. So when I think of Jesus as Lord, 
And I recognize his power and his authority, but I'm so glad that he's so gentle, that he cares so deeply. This is the one we honor at Christmas time. Yeah, he, he came like a winter snow. That's a beautiful image, isn't it? He didn't come like some might have expected. And even as he grew into manhood and as he began his ministry, there were people who, who said, no, you're the wrong kind. You don't fit our image. You're not the kind of Messiah that we need. How wrong they were. Because he's exactly the Messiah that we need. You know what the word Messiah means? Messiah is the Hebrew. Christ is the Greek. It means chosen one or anointed one. And what was he chosen to do? The king of glory. He was chosen to take the, the crown of gold off his head, lay it aside, and put on his head a crown of thorns. Instead of the throne, he chose a cross. And the reason he did that because we were desperately in need of someone who could do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I love the excitement of Christmas. I love the songs and the sounds, all the things that go with it. But I don't ever want to miss the heart of Christmas. The heart that was revealed in the life of a man who gave everything he had so that I could become what I could never become on my own. So that I could be a precious child of God. Didn't earn it, didn't work for it. But it's a gift. I have an idea that sometime in this week, some of you are going to unwrap a few gifts. But the most precious gift of all isn't something you're going to find under your tree or out in your driveway. The most precious gift you can receive is the presence of this Holy One in your heart. And my friend, if you don't know him as your Savior, that needs to change. And if you need to talk about that with someone because you're not sure, let's talk. You want to make Christmas special this year? Make sure he's at the center of your life, as well as the center of your celebration this time of year. Let's pray together. And Father, why, why should we call him Emmanuel? Because the message is so clear. You weren't waiting for us to make our way to heaven because we couldn't make it. Couldn't do it on our own. And like other, some other systems in our world, it wasn't about us reaching to you, it's about you reaching to us. And his name was Jesus. What does that mean? It means Jehovah saves. It means that you care so much for us that you would reclaim us when we were a lost cause. And so we sing our songs and we observe our traditions. And we light our candles and we, we gather with people we care about. But in the midst of that wonderful time together, help us to remember that there was a gift, the very first Christmas gift. And let's make sure that we unwrap it. Thank you, Father, for the time we can spend in worship and praise. And we ask that you receive our worship, not just because we're attending a service, but because we choose to make it a lifestyle where we put you first in all things. And I pray, Lord, that if there's one of us in this room today who is not certain that he recognizes you as the Savior of his life or her life. I pray that you would enter into that heart. Behold, you stand at the door and knock. Help us to open and let you in. We love you, Father. Thank you for Christmas.
In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There's a beautiful chorus that um, has been around a long time. We're going to sing. Um, the, the name of the song is There's Something About That Name. Uh, you may not need a book, but there's a, a number there, 102. But uh, as you sing, sing that name, remember, um, it is the most precious of names. If you want to talk, you want to pray, you might want to just come up here and just kneel at the altar. Or you might want to spend a moment with me. I don't care how this works, but... I want you to know that this is precious holy time that we don't need to waste. So let's stand together, and as Rhonda leads us, let's sing together. You know, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate, but it seems like at Christmas time, there's more uh, heartache and more tragedy and more difficulty than at other times of the year. I don't know, maybe it's just because of the season it seems that way, but you've got all the folks who, have, who, who are suffering because of storms that have wrecked their lives. Uh, we have people in our own community whose homes are coming apart, uh, who have tremendous challenges in relationships. We have people with health issues. We have people with spiritual issues. We have all kinds of things going on. This week, this week, I know you're busy. I know you have things you need to get done. Uh, maybe your Christmas list isn't complete yet. But somebody needs to hear from you. Somebody needs to feel grace from you. Somebody needs to know that you are aware of, of who they are and what they might need, and you offer yourself to them. You want to give a Christmas gift that matters? Let's minister to one another. Let's minister to people who are in need because there's so many of us who do have need. Thank you for being in worship today. Remember our Christmas Eve service. We will meet next Sunday for worship. Um, I know there'll be a huge crowd here on the 26th, but we love having you here today. And if you're here for the very first time, this is a wonderful family you need to get to know, and we would want to love on you. So please come back. We love having you here. Now let's pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he grant you the peace that comes. It comes without our ability to understand, but comes so freely. May God bless you richly. And may we be so thankful for the good things he brings us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.